Okay, why don't we go ahead and get started? I've got about four past seven. Welcome everybody. So glad to have you all back for the 2024 uh, ACP and P educational series. Uh, we're really excited tonight to have Dr. Michael Foote with us from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. He's going to be talking to us about a very timely and quickly moving topic, advances in genomics and immunology to classify and treat appendiceal cancer. Before I introduce and turn this over to Dr. Foote, just a couple of quick announcements. One, just a reminder to all of you that the Appendix Cancer PMP Research Foundation's mission is really focused primarily on two goals. One, we fund and support research to um, increase treatments out, research and development of treatments for appendix cancer with the hope of one day finding a cure. And two, which brings us here tonight, we fund and support educational programs for physicians, patients, caregivers, and families about this rare cancer. And we you know, do that, one, to increase awareness, and two, as we do in this webinar series, really to help keep us all kind of uh, apace with developments in the space. Um, all of this work is made possible by the generosity of our donors, and we are so, so grateful to all of you for that. Quick housekeeping announcements. Uh, one, we will have Q&A after this session. This session is going to wrap up at about 8 o'clock. We did get a lot of questions for the pre-submit, but Dr. Foote has kindly agreed to try to get to as many as we can. We probably will not be able to get to all of them, but he will do his level best. Um, your lines, oh, I will, should say with the Q&A, we are not using the chat box. If you do want to submit a question as Dr. Foote is presenting, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and not the chat. Um, lines are muted. We've got over 300 people registered for this conference, so we, we have muted all lines. The presentation is being recorded. You will have immediate playback for your registration. Um, and then if you have friends that did not register and that want to watch a recording, that should be available at some point soon. And last but not least, if you have any questions about our webinar series or you have some topics, presenters you'd like to recommend, there's my contact information. Always welcome ideas. And so with that, now I want to introduce Dr. Foote. Um, Dr. Michael Foote is an attending physician scientist who cares for patients with gastrointestinal cancers, including a specialty in appendiceal cancer at the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Dr. Foote, I love his work. He's all over the place, um, big mind. He works in a translational research lab where he integrates experiments in genomics, immunology, and bioinformatics to identify why gastrointestinal tumors evade the immune system and metastasize to different regions, including the peritoneal cavity. And he's also involved in drug development work to design and run clinical trials for drugs that boost the immune system against cancer and or target specific tumor proteins. So we're so delighted to have you, Dr. Foote. The floor is all yours. Oh, thank you so much for that kind introduction. And it's it's a real honor to be here with all of you. And uh, I'm just very, very, been very excited about this for a while. So I'm looking forward to answering a lot of your questions. Um, I thought Deborah and I chat and we thought it might be a good idea to go ahead and start with uh, a little bit more of a, a formal presentation, which I'll get going right now. Um, and this is really geared towards you, uh, mostly geared towards patients and their families and advocates. I do have some slides at the end that are a little bit more science physician oriented, but my goal is to try and make this accessible to everybody because I, um, I think immunotherapy is something that's very exciting, but it's something that is pretty difficult to understand. I mean, I even have trouble with this and I'm some, one of the people studying it. <laughs> so I'm hoping that by the end of the session, we'll at least come away with a, a general understanding of what immunotherapy is um, the challenges, but also some of the opportunities in appendix cancer, 
and uh, and I, I'm hoping to have a very optimistic tone to the talk. So thank you for inviting me. I do have a few disclosures that are not uh, particularly relevant to the talk. And just as I mentioned, we'll have a couple topics for today. The first topic will be an overview of how the immune system recognizes or ignores cancer. Then we'll move specifically into genomics. And we'll talk a little bit about how the genomics of tumors can signal to the immune system about how dangerous they are. And I'll try to tie this in more with appendix cancer. The spoiler is, as many of you may be aware, is that we don't have a lot of big trials in appendix cancer because it is a pretty rare disease. So a lot of what we know about the immune system comes from other types of cancer. But I'll try my best to apply this to appendix cancer and convince you of a few uh, principles that still apply. And then uh, I, lastly, I'll end on some promising approaches for the future and uh, research that we're doing here at Memorial, as well as uh, by very smart people around the country, and uh, try and give you a sense of some of these new technologies that you might have heard about and, and how they might apply to, to patients with appendix cancer. And throughout the talk, I think the two main principles that I want to give is I think it's good to be realistic. You know, I um, when a doctor is offering you a treatment, I think it's good to know that um, realistically, what are the chances of it working? And with immunotherapy, there are a lot of different ideas out there about it. Um, it's kind of promised to be a panacea, which of course I would love it to be, but there are some realistic side effects and, and limitations to it. And I think it's important to talk about those, even if it may be not exactly what we want to hear. And then of course, optimism is important. You know, anyone who's gone through this journey of having a cancer diagnosis knows how important it is to have hope, to look towards the future. And, um, uh, you know, so I, I'm very much a part of that. And, and hopefully at the end of the talk, we'll all be feeling a little bit better. Okay, so let's start on in. I'm gonna go at a, a moderate pace uh, to leave time for questions. I may speed up a little bit if I sense that I'm, I'm going slower because I wanna make sure I get to your questions. So let's talk about how the immune system recognizes sick cells. And by sick cells, I mean cells that might be infected with a virus. I also am talking about cells that aren't behaving normally, mainly cancer cells, which come from normal cells, but turn into tumors. So when a sick cell, uh, let's say a cell is infected by a virus, the virus squirts its DNA or RNA inside of the cell and this is not normal DNA or RNA. This is abnormal nucleic acid. This is stuff that's not supposed to be there. And tumors as well have the same effect. Tumors have abnormal mutations in their DNA that are not normal, that are not supposed to be there. So in a sense, it's all part of the same idea. There's abnormal DNA or RNA inside of a cell. This abnormal DNA or RNA is then expressed by the native machinery of the cell. So it basically turns this DNA or RNA into proteins. Proteins are the main uh, engines that drive a cell forward, that make it grow, that make it do all of its functions. DNA and RNA are like the blueprints. So the cell sees these blueprints and turns them into proteins. And with respect to the immune system, we call these proteins neoantigens or new proteins that are kind of weird. They're not supposed to be there. They're strange. So they're neoantigens, a new weird protein. These new weird proteins caused uh, by the cell making, looking at the blueprints and making these proteins are constantly shown to the immune system. The cell does this naturally. It reaches inside itself and presents proteins from inside of itself to the immune system and says, hey, how am I looking? How does this look? Does this look weird? It does this naturally. This is an evolved mechanism that evolved over millions of years for humans. And it's how the body tells the immune system, hey, this how's take my temperature. How do I look to you today? It constantly does this. And that process is called antigen presentation or presenting weird proteins to the outside, to the immune cells. Now, if these proteins look really weird, the immune cell says, huh, you really look pretty sick. I can't let you survive. It's too risky. You might do weird stuff. You might infect other cells. You might turn into a tumor, so I'm going to kill you. And that's the process. This whole process is called immunorecognition. Something about the cell just isn't right. The proteins from the cell are displayed on the surface to the immune system. The immune system figures out that the cell is sick and the immune system kills it. And that's how it's supposed to work. 
Sometimes these immune cells have buddies that go around and gobble up proteins in the environment. They're not necessarily sick themselves. They're just gobbling up proteins that are around the environment. And they also display these proteins to immune cells. And sometimes these immune cells can remember what these weird proteins might look like, and they go and try and find them. So that's another way that the immune system can recognize cancer. These APCs, immune cells, number five on the list, suck up antigens from the environment and show it to these immune cells. And that lets them go and find things that are not behaving normally. Okay, so it can be a little confusing, but hopefully you get the gist of it. Cancer proteins are not normal. They are hijacked versions of normal proteins that are, maybe they're more active than they normally should be. Maybe they give, have an increased function that they shouldn't have. So these proteins are not normal, but yet the cancer cell needs them to behave abnormally, to grow, to spread. So these proteins are both a gift to the cancer cell because the cancer cell gets special superpowers from them, but it's also a liability because remember what I just told you, the cancer cell is constantly grabbing proteins from inside and displaying it to the immune system. So if the immune system recognizes these weird proteins, the cancer cell's done for. The immune system will kill the cancer cell. So it's both a gift and a curse that the, the cancer cell needs these special proteins that are both weird, but also help the cancer cell grow. The sum total of these signals, these abnormal proteins, makes the tumors appear more or less attractive to the immune system. And how I've depicted this here is this principle of immunology called cold versus hot tumors. So cold tumors don't have a lot of abnormal proteins or that the proteins that are there don't look that weird to the immune system. They're not that enticing. The immune system doesn't really care about them so much. Hot tumors are the opposite. Hot tumors are very what we call immunogenic. They stimulate the immune system to fight it. And they're in a good way, they stimulate good immune cells to go in and try and destroy it. So there are these, there's this principle of cold versus hot tumors. Now you might ask yourself, well, well, how does a hot tumor hide? Wouldn't it just be devastated by the immune system? Well, tumors over time can be pretty smart. They express on the surface these switches that turn off immune cells that get too close. And these switches are called checkpoints. And you can see two of them here, PD-1 and CTLA-4. And they look like switches, like levers. The tumor cell will express this PDL1, which pulls on a switch of the immune cell and makes it go to sleep. Same sort of idea with CTLA-4. So even though you have these weird proteins, these antigens right here that I'm showing you, that the immune system should recognize, the tumor is smart and it turns a switch to turn off the immune cells. And then the immune cells ignore the tumor instead of killing it. Immunotherapies are designed to boost the immune system so that it overcomes these switches that tumors use and allows the immune system to kill and destroy the cancer and remember what it looks like so that it can't return. And there's lots of different types of immunotherapy. Immunotherapy is a pretty general term. And we'll talk about some specific ones a little bit later. Let's talk about the example that is the best example of this whole process working the way we want it to with our immune system killing cancer. So in our center, we had a trial that we did. I was very fortunate to be a part of this where we studied a rare type of colorectal cancer called mismatch repair deficient colorectal cancer. This is a type of cancer that has lots and lots and lots of weird proteins because it has a ton of mutations. Basically the spell check that edits the DNA inside the cancer cell is broken or deficient. So these tumors accumulate lots of mistakes in the DNA. And that's why they become so hypermutated, why they have so many weird proteins. It's very rare. It's only about five to 10% of rectal cancers, but it's very important. And I'll show you why. Rectal cancer in general is treated differently than appendix cancer. The tumor is in a tricky spot. So patients that have an early stage rectal cancer, meaning a stage one through three disease that hasn't spread anywhere, they get a lot of treatment. They have up to four months of chemotherapy. Then they get radiation for about a month and a half. And even after all of that, over half of them need to have a big surgery where the entire rectum is removed and sewn up. So there's no hole there anymore. And the patient has bowel movements through an ostomy back. 
their whole life. So it's, it, as you can imagine, a life-changing process. Um, it, it's a big deal for patients. It's, it has a lot of side effects to it. So our group wanted to try something special in these patients that had mismatch repair deficient tumors with lots and lots of mutations. Our hypothesis was that immunotherapy in this setting could do a really good job because there's so many weird proteins that if we could just turn off one of these switches with an antibody, then the immune system could recognize the cancer and kill it. So we hypothesized that using these immunotherapy drugs, checkpoint inhibitors, PD-1 inhibitors, would be very successful in these tumors. So, uh, and this trial was led by Dr. Andrea Sersig and Dr. Luis Diaz, who are my uh, mentors and colleagues and close friends. And um, we decided to do this trial at MSK to both improve outcomes for our patients, but also decrease side effects to try and prevent people from having to get surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy. So what we did is, this is a patient example. Sorry, it's a little graphic, but um, I thought it was a, a neat way to show it. So this is a tumor in the rectum. You can see it's pretty, pretty ugly, um, swollen, causing the patient a lot of pain. And uh, if you're a physician, you can tell that it's also there on the MRI scan as well as the PET scan. And this is right before we started the drug. We gave the drug before the patient was supposed to get surgery. And remarkably, after about six weeks, you see an incredible change. This tumor, instead of ugly and, and swollen, is now starting to disappear. And in fact, after three months, the tumor has completely disappeared. No surgery, no chemotherapy, no radiation. And you can start to see it disappearing as well on the other scans. And in fact, this patient was cured without, with just with one immunotherapy drug before surgery. And you, you can see they stay cured. And this is actually a little bit of an old slide. They've been, uh, had no disease for, for over three years. In fact, we did this for now over 40 patients with this exact same story, a mismatch repair deficient rectal tumor. We gave them just immunotherapy and 100% of them, every single patient, was cured without needing surgery, radiation, or chemotherapy. So this had like, never been done before, so it was very exciting, and it got a lot of buzz, and you may have heard about it on, on Instagram or Twitter. Um, so this was our study, and we're, we did it with other tumors too. Very interesting thing that I want to show you. These are sections of the tumor with different dyes that stain different types of cells. Now you can see the blue and the green here are uh, mostly the blue, are, are colon, are rectal cancer cells. Those are cancer cells. This is before the patient got treatment. After the patient got treatment, you start to see these white cells. These are immune cells, good guys, infiltrating the tumors and starting to kill them. And after this, you see this almost like a nuclear bomb went off inside of the tumor, this hot red uh, necrosis where the tumor is breaking apart. And afterwards you see white cells, good, the good guys, are walking around here and there's much less tumor cells there. It's completely gone. And when you talk to patients, they say they feel so much better after just a couple of weeks, which is really incredible. So the big points of this first step are that the immune system constantly polices your body looking for sick cells. And those can be cells that are infected by viruses or they can be cells that are on their way to becoming cancer. And the way that they do this is by recognizing abnormal proteins inside of the tumors. And we call them, as scientists, we call them neoantigens or new proteins. Neo means new. But not every cancer is the same. Tumors have different amounts as well as types of neoantigens. And that leads us to the principle of a hot tumor, which is very exciting to the immune system, versus a cold tumor that's pretty good at shooing the immune system away from it. One of the ways that tumors shoo the immune system away is by using these cell surface switches to turn off the immune system. Those are called checkpoint molecules. And if we have drugs that block the switches, we can cause dramatic responses, especially in tumors that have lots and lots of these immunogenic mutations, very hot mismatch repair deficient tumors, which are also very rare. They're not common. They're less than 5% of rectal cancers. Okay, let's tie this in a little bit more to appendix cancer. I just mentioned to you that different types of cancer have different numbers as well as types of proteins inside of them. And some of these are more attracted to the immune system than others. For example, the type we just talked about, the really hot tumors, I put in red here. These are mismatch repair deficient tumors. They have tons of mutations. Look how hot they are on this axis. They're all the way to the right. And 
they also have a lot of shrinkage to immunotherapy. That's why they're in the up right corner. And there are other types of cancer that are like this too. Melanomas are like this. They do really well with immunotherapy. Um, other skin cancers do really well with immunotherapy. There's other types of mismatch repair deficient tumors that do well. And you'll see at the bottom here in the cold blue color is conventional colorectal cancer. Unfortunately, for 90 plus percent of colorectal cancers, they're not that hot. They're pretty cold. The immune system doesn't really like them that much. And that's why they're all the way here at the bottom because the immunotherapy doesn't work very well in the vast majority of cancers that are mismatch repair proficient. So that difference between deficient and proficient is really important. So we wrote a paper, which is uh, available to everyone. You can read it. Um, the data set is all online. Everyone can, can, can use it for their research to look at the genomics, the proteins of appendix cancer. And what we found is appendix cancer does have a lot of mutated proteins that are weird and normal. They're not supposed to be there. And we found three in particular that seem to be very important, KRAS, TV53, and GNAS. We know this is important because we study tumors that have or don't have these features. For example, tumors that have TP53 mutations are more aggressive. They tend to penetrate deep into the body with tentacles. This is called stromal invasion. And you can see that, the difference between these pictures. Look how ugly this picture looks with these blue-like cells penetrating into this person's organ. Meanwhile, up here, the cells are just sort of sprinkled on top, like a layer of cream cheese on top of the organ. And these are different types of cancer that we identified with appendix cancer that you find by doing genetic sequencing. We wanted to look at the sum total of all of the abnormal signals in the appendix cancer to see whether these tumors might be more exciting to the immune system. And what we found is that they don't have a lot of mutations. Unlike those rectal tumors that I showed you, the patients that did so well with immunotherapy, Appendix tumors don't have that many signals to give to the immune system. The tumor mutational burden is very low. So one of the questions you might ask yourself is how well do tumors with lower tumor mutational burdens, with less signals, how well do they do with immunotherapy? Another question you might ask is, well, there are some tumors in this picture that have higher numbers of mutations. They're up here over 10 mutations. What about the rare appendix tumors that have a higher number of abnormal proteins inside of them? So there was a, a smart group of scientists who looked to answer this question. They said, okay, we're gonna look at tumors based on how many mutations they have. And we're gonna have two main groups. We're gonna have tumors that have a lot of mutations and we're gonna have tumors that don't have that many mutations. And then we're gonna compare how well they do with immunotherapy. And they studied this in rare cancers. Now they didn't have appendix cancer, unfortunately, but they did look at, at uncommon cancers, anal cancer, neuroendocrine tumors, um, endometrial cancer, cancers that aren't that common. And what they found is when they did their analysis, tumors that had more mutations had a higher chance of shrinking. About one in three patients with high mutations had their tumors shrink after getting immunotherapy. And these, by the way, are stage four cancers. These are, are, are different than the cancers I told you before, which are early stage. These are later stage cancers. These are tumors that have spread to other parts of the body. When they looked at patients that had lower numbers of mutations, the response rates of immunotherapy was very low. It's only about 6% of patients that had a response. And you can break it down by the cancer type. I think a big point here is also is that there weren't that many tumors that had high mutations. For example, only 15 endometrial cancers compared to 67 had high numbers of mutations. So this is in a relatively small group of people. One very important thing they noticed that tumors that had high numbers of mutations shrank after immunotherapy. But at the end of the day, the patients didn't live any longer. Whether the tumor had high numbers of mutations or lower number of mutations, the survival was pretty similar between the two groups. 50% lived one year, 51% lived one year. They were virtually identical. And because of this, the federal government, the FDA, approved immunotherapy for anybody who has more than 10 mutations per megabase in their tumor. They said, okay, we're, we believe your data. If your tumor has high mutations, you can have immunotherapy. We'll pay for it. Medicare will pay for it. We were a little bit skeptical about this because um, we didn't want people to be hurt by immunotherapy because immunotherapy does have some side effects and we can get into that you know, in, in the question and answer. Um, 
So we just wanted to make sure people were actually benefiting from immunotherapy and it wasn't all smoke and mirrors. So we did a paper we published um, in the New England Journal where we took 137 patients with colorectal cancer. Now remember, the study I just showed you didn't have anybody with colorectal cancer. These were rare cancers, not very common. So colorectal cancer is a pretty common cancer. So we looked at 137 people and we split them into two groups, just like that other study did. Tumors that had more than 10 and tumors that had less than 10, okay? And we saw a similar effect. The blue line, people that had tumors with over 10 mutations, they lived longer after immunotherapy. Look how much longer they lived. At, you know, the average survival was 43 months in this population, which are pretty sick. These are patients that had already gotten lots of treatment. They're pretty sick. Meanwhile, patients that had low numbers of mutations, they didn't live very long. They only lived about a year on average. So you might say, well, this just proves their point. That's, that's exactly what they said. There's a nuance. We looked at the same exact patients. And in this case, we separated the patients based on mismatch repair status. So remember I told you the mismatch repair deficient tumors are very hot, very exciting to the immune system, whereas mismatch repair proficient tumors are not as exciting. And those are most of colon cancers or mismatch repair proficient. What we found was that prior study, they didn't separate based on mismatch repair uh, status. When we separate, we find that all of the benefit of the high mutations is only seen in patients that have mismatch repair deficient tumors, these very rare hypermutated tumors. If you have a run-of-the-mill colon cancer, it doesn't matter if you have over 10 mutations or not. You do about the same. They don't do very well. Okay, now I know this might be a little confusing, but the, I'll talk about the punchline in a second. We applied this to other types of cancers that are common, non-small cell lung cancer, melanoma, head and neck cancer, all these other types of cancers together. We did the same analysis. Okay, And we specifically looked at the run-of-the-mill cancers, the ones that are mismatch repair proficient, not these really rare ones that are mismatch repair deficient. And what we found is there are a couple cancer types where the number of mutations actually makes a difference. Lung cancer, which is treated, everyone gets immunotherapy with lung cancer these days. Melanoma, head and neck cancer. These are cancers that do well with immunotherapy. However, most cancers don't do that well with immunotherapy regardless of how many mutations they have. And this is like all these common cancers that you see here and other cancers like brain cancer. So the punchline was a little pessimistic, just to be honest with you. It's the, it's, the point is that it's not just the number of mutations that you have, it's the type of mutations that you have. There's nothing magical about a threshold of a tumor mutational burden of 10 or more. It's not a good reason to give someone immunotherapy. Indeed, mismatch repair status, deficient versus proficient, is really important. So if a colon cancer was mismatch repair proficient, it didn't respond well, and patients didn't live longer after immunotherapy. Appendix cancer is pretty similar to mismatch repair proficient tumors. The average number of mutations is very low. It's only three. Whereas these hot tumors, they have mutation burdens in the 50s and 60s, much, much higher. So we did this, I did this with a talk and a, 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 some other grant I wrote. We looked at seven patients with appendix cancer, stage four appendix cancer, who got immunotherapy at our center. You can see them here. Five of them got these uh, antibodies, like I showed you before with the rectal cancer patient, and two of them got a special drug. They were all different types of appendix cancer. They were mucinous, goblet cell, colon cancer type, colon type, different differentiations. And then I also put here, because it's a little important, which ones had liver metastases or not. So these are the seven patients that got immunotherapy with stage four appendix cancer. And what we saw was no patient had a response. Every single patient, uh, none of them had the tumor shrink after immunotherapy. There were a few patients that had stable disease, meaning the tumors didn't grow very much. And you can see that most of these patients didn't have liver mets, which is important. And we can talk about that later, but um, and in fact, uh, several patients uh, had the tumor grow on immunotherapy, and most of these patients had liver mats. And the average lifespan of the patients once they got immunotherapy wasn't very long. It was about four months or so before the tumor started to grow. So it really wasn't that effective in appendix cancer, the conventional run-of-the-mill immunotherapy drugs we're giving nowadays. So you can sort of build this chart where you say, okay, mismatch repair deficient tumors are like the gold standard. Those are the ones that disappear completely with immunotherapy sometime. And they're very rare, they're only 
of cancers, but they have a high number and high quality of mutations and, and immunotherapy works well. But the average GI tumor doesn't really work very well. It, you know, and that's where I put appendix cancer right now. I know this is sounding pessimistic. I promise there's gonna be some optimism. So again, the punchline I just mentioned, we expect that this is the same with appendix cancer. The tumors that are, these tumors are poorly immunogenic. Conventional immunotherapies don't work very well. Okay, so let's get some optimism in the room. Let's talk about where we're going. And for anybody that wants to read more about this, we published another paper. It's available to everyone. You can Google it. And this is where a lot of my writing comes from. Um, and this is facts and hopes with an optimistic angle. Okay, let's talk about a couple different technologies. So the first is how to make immunotherapies better, specifically antibodies that turn off the switches that the cancer cell uses to shut down the immune system. So there's a new generation of antibodies coming that are better than what you've seen before. Two of these drugs are called, one of these drugs is called botancilumab. And what these scientists did is they took this antibody and they modified one part of it to make it really, really, really active to destroy a type of immune cell that's actually bad for you, that turns off the immune system. And what they found is in mismatch repair proficient tumors, tumors that are not supposed to work uh, with immunotherapy, the immunotherapy is not supposed to work, about one in four patients had their tumors shrink. So this was pretty remarkable. And we actually did this trial at MSK and we're, we're continuing with this trial specifically for colorectal cancer, although there's some exciting updates coming as well for patients with appendix cancer. So that's a very exciting new generation of these antibodies that's coming and it's gonna be here and hopefully patients with appendix cancer can get it. Okay, let's talk about another strategy. So I just mentioned to you that appendix cancer is a cold tumor. It doesn't have a lot of characteristics that make it super exciting to the immune system. So one idea would be, well, why don't we try to boost its, uh, its, its hotness? Why don't we try to make it hotter? And there's a couple ways you could do this with vaccines, with, with viruses, believe it or not, that make the tumors hotter. So one way that our lab is working on that we've had some success with is by using drugs that actually increase mutagenesis. Now, this might sound a little strange. You said, well, mutations cause the immune the cancer cell to gain new special superpowers. Why would you want to do that? Well, some of these mutations don't necessarily cause superpowers, but may give the tumor more proteins that it can display to the immune system to help the immune system recognize how bad it is. And in fact, there are two different trials that have been doing this in patients with colorectal cancer using a drug called temozolomide. And this is just how the, the studies were done. It's not super important if, if uh, unless you're a doctor, you can see kind of how they did it, but they basically gave these patients this drug and then evaluated if the tumors became hotter. Again, the goal of this was to turn cold tumors into hot tumors that the immune system can recognize and kill. And actually, a lot of these cold tumors became hotter. And in fact, one out of three or more patients had the tumor shrink after getting this drug and then having immunotherapy afterwards. It was pretty remarkable. So that was pretty exciting. And that's another strategy that our lab is working on to try and, and make this even more potent and extend to other types of cancer, including appendix cancer. Okay, let's talk about a third strategy. We're going to have plenty of time for questions. This th third strategy is something called a T cell engager or a bispecific antibody. Now this is a long name, but what it basically means is it's a lasso where one end sticks onto an immune cell and the other end sticks onto a cancer cell and they're lassoed together with an antibody. So they come and look each other right in the eyes and we pepper the immune cell with these signals that says warning, warning, warning. And that makes the immune cell recognize the tumor cell as an enemy. By specific antibody, by means two, two heads, one attaches to the immune cell, one attaches to the uh, cancer cell. And these are some examples of drugs that are out there in the market that are showing promise. So this is just what I said. We make a leash where one cell, one end attaches to the immune cell. Here's the end. And the other end attaches to the tumor cell and it brings them together to look at them so the immune cell can kill it. Okay, and the specific cell that we like to talk about are T cells. T cells are like the warriors. They have their swords and they kill and the cancer cells. So one of these drugs is called civisatinib and Dr. Agiles, who is one of my uh, close friends and we're lab mates, we work in the same lab, has done a lot of research on this. And um, one of the really important things I wanna tell you 
Now, for those of you familiar with appendix cancer, appendix cancer tends to secrete a lot of mucin. And in fact, a lot of these bispecific drugs are targeting mucin. MUC17 is a mucin. MUC1 is a mucin. CA is a type of mucin. EGFR is a type of mucin. So these drugs could be effective in appendix cancer. They target mucin on the surface and grab an immune cell and bring them all together. And in fact, there, as you can see in this plot, uh, low means the tumors are shrinking, high means they're growing. There was a good number of people where the tumors after they got this drug shrink. So that's great. Um, and that's what we want to see. All right, let's talk about our last one, which is something called CAR T cells. And you might've heard of CAR T cells. It's very popular in the, in the news. Um, and, and basically what these are, I'm gonna show you on the next slide. Um, this is from the government, uh, which is a very pretty figure. This is training your immune system to become super soldiers against cancer. What they do is they take T cells out of your body. So they do a blood draw. They bring these T cells into a lab and they modify them using genetic engineering. And these are techniques that my lab does too. And what they do is they give these T cells weapons called CARs. These are little spears that stick out of the tumor cell. They grow them up so that you get millions of them. And then they give them right back to you. And these warriors go in and try and find the cancer cells with their spears to poke them and kill them. Okay? That's what CAR T cells are. Now, CAR T cells sound great. And they are great. The tricky part is the immune system and the cancer cells can still turn off these new cars. So they're not perfect yet. Um, but there was a study done in patients with gastric cancer that was published in a big journal, Nature Medicine, that showed some very interesting responses. These are all the patients in this trial that had their tumors shrink. If the bars go down, that means the tumor size decreased after getting this CAR T treatment. And there were a bunch of people where the tumor shrunk. So that's very exciting. And we're hoping that this treatment can be something that would uh, help patients with appendix cancer too. Okay, let's talk about a couple challenges. It's good to know our enemy, right? So many appendix cancers express mucin. We just talked about that. Now, mucin could be an advantage for us because we can design drugs like bispecific antibodies, like CAR T cells with their spears that target mucin. But mucin is something that appendix cancer probably uses for its own benefit. It secretes it on the surface to hide from the immune system. It also might make a little nest with mucin to help it survive in hostile environments like the peritoneal cavity. Like I just said, METs are typically in the peritoneal cavity and the immune system there is a little bit different. There are different immunosuppressive signals in the peritoneal cavity that we have to be very smart to overcome. The challenge that's plagued all of us who do appendix cancer research as well as you all is just how expensive these drugs can be. CAR T cells are very, very expensive. They're like a million and a half dollars a person. They're very, very expensive. It's not a therapy that we can afford every patient with cancer. We bank, we go bankrupt. Um, so we're trying to get the cost down, of course, and you know, companies need to bring the cost down. Um, the trials are very difficult to run. You need a lot of people to run a clinical trial, a lot of money. And Sometimes drug companies want to target big cancers that are very popular because they know that breast cancer, colon cancer are cancers that a lot of people get, and those patients are going to need the drugs and will provide the company with revenue. And these are realistic things that we have to be aware of. So we that's why it's so important for me to communicate with you guys and how important the ACPMP is because they give us funding. They help fund my lab. Um, we need industry support, and we have been fortunate to find some companies that are that are looking with us and working with us to develop new tools. I want to leave you with this. I know there were some um, moments of pessimism, but there are a lot of optimistic approaches. We're really trying to make immunotherapy a revolution in GI cancers. It's already been a revolutionary revolutionary in some cancers like melanoma, and CAR T cells have been revolutionary in lymphoma. Um, we're trying to make it more of a thing in, col in colorectal cancer, in appendix cancer, and the, the progress we've seen in colorectal cancer is very encouraging. So please stay in touch with us. We have a great team here at MSK. Um, Here's some friendly faces that some of you may have visited. Um, you know, Dr. Sersik and I work very closely together. We're like two peas in a pod. Dr. Garrett Nash is an incredible world leader in surgery and appendix cancer. Dr. Karakunis is a new face on the block who's just a wonderful guy. And he is um, uh, now open at MSK and a, and a fantastic scientist and, and researcher. And then my mentor, Dr. Diaz, who I've been with for over 10 years, who basically created this story. He's the godfather of immunotherapy, brilliant guy. Um, and Benoit Rousseau, uh, who's my partner in crime in the lab. This is a, a 
picture we did, we actually were on the cover of Nature Medicine. Um, and and this, these crabs represent um, cancer and the wall is immunotherapy. So we're hoping that we can create a build a wall here to reduce the burden of cancer. And I want to, of course, thank the ACPMP um, as well as all of you for listening. And, and that's, that's all I have. So I'm, I'd love to uh, hand it back over to Deborah. I'll stop sharing my screen and um, we can uh, maybe answer some folks' questions. Yeah, no, absolutely. Let's do a quick time check. That was that was really excellent. I so appreciate always, Dr. Foote, the way you break everything down for somebody like me. Um, now we do have a lot of questions. I'm gonna try to bundle them as best I can to maximize our time. But one one type of question that we got here and we get all the time. Um, including from myself, is do you have any thoughts? I mean, you, you talked about this fantastic innovation, really promising innovation going on, you know, where, you know, like with colorectal cancer and some of the challenges that it suffers similar, similar to appendix in terms of, um, you know, not being microsatellite uh, deficient, mostly being proficient, not having a lot of actionable tumors. And so how the heck can we get appendix cancer in some of those trials? Like not, not necessarily the trials that you talked about here, although that would be good, but in general, like how can we do that? I mean, this comes up a lot. We, you know, we have colorectal, how do we get appendiceal? And, and this also ties back to a question we got about, well, hey, can appendix cancer be studied with some of the more common cancers that might have some commonalities that, that could overcome the very kind of expense burden that you were just talking about? Yeah, it's a fantastic question and a big question. I mean, I have a couple answers. So a simple answer is, if something is improved in colorectal cancer, it almost certainly will be applicable to appendix cancer because our government realizes that it's not reasonable for uh, patients with appendix cancer to have to wait until a huge trial opens up and just for them. Colorectal cancer is similar enough to appendix cancer that most of the time treatments for colorectal cancer work okay or pretty well for appendix cancer or maybe even better. So I think that's one simple answer is as we see things getting better in colorectal cancer, a rising tide raises all ships and it will get better for appendix cancer too, even if we don't necessarily have to prove it in appendix cancer. The second more interesting answer is how do we get people on studies now? Because people are sick, people need something now, today, tomorrow. Yes. Um, and I think that's a tough question. I think, you know, we're, you know, there's a lot of, um, I think this community is really special. And I think there's a lot of advocates in big centers that do a lot of research. You know, Memorial Sloan Kettering, we have a big appendix group here um, that I'm a part of, Dr. Sursik, Dr. Nash, Dr. Karakunis. I think MD Anderson has a fantastic group as well. Um, you know, people at the Dana-Farber, people in Boston, people in Yale, um, people in Wake Forest, North Carolina. So there are a lot of big research centers that are really invested in bringing these studies to patients with appendix cancer. And, you know, we're writing grants, we're writing... Um, letters to companies to say, hey, listen, you know, this, um, this is really is important and necessary. And a lot of, a lot of companies have programs for rare cancers because, you know, frankly, it's good marketing for them. Let's be realistic, but also, you know, they realize that, you know, it, it's, it's an important thing for them to contribute to. Also, it's a, it's a way they can get an indication for their drug. And once they get in the door with the FDA, the FDA tends to like them. And then they start to approve them for more of the bigger more popular cancers like breast cancer and lung cancer and all those cancers where there are you know, hundreds of thousands of people. Um, the other thing I'll say is that um, we are trying to do some trials here at MSK. I'm hoping to have an exciting update you know, in the next couple months about that for immunotherapy. I know there are people in, in other centers that are looking to try and do this. Um, there are compassionate use programs if people have um, an especially interesting case, you know, talk to your physician, talk to, talk to us see if there's a case where we think, wow, there's something really special about this tumor that we think might work well. And you can write to the company and say, hey, I know you don't have a trial for, for appendix cancer, but you know my tumor has this special characteristic to it. I think you should let me have the drug. And then the last thing I'll say, there are these, um, there are these basket trials 
right? Yeah. That look for, yeah. um, exactly, that are, for and for those who aren't familiar, these are studies that look at lots of different types of cancer um, and they have a special marker. So for example, I mentioned that the bispecific antibodies are like anchors, right? And one arm of it grabs a cancer cell. Now that is a specific molecule that the cancer cell has on its surface. So maybe it's MUC2, for example. Now, if you have a MUC2 in your appendix tumor, it might not matter if it's appendix cancer. As long as you have MUC2, you're good, and you can go on this research trial. So there are a lot of studies like that, especially ones that are targeted, like bispecific antibodies and CAR T cells, things like that, where you can you can get on the trial. Um, so as these studies come about, I think hopefully people will have more luck. I know that was a little long-winded, but I know it's on no, people's No, it, it, it's a complicated situation, but it's just something that I think as patients and, and families is always niggling at us, but because I love like the research, it's like, okay, so when we look at immunotherapy and the typical characteristics, we don't have that with appendiceal. We don't have that with colorectal and others, but hey, let's make lem you know, lemonade out of lemons and let's look at, well, how do we work with the mismatch repair proficient? You know, let's take what's common and really reverse things. And so to have appendix cancer included in that, and it sounds like maybe there'll be something coming down the road. Please let ACPMP know when it does so that we can blast it out. But um, yeah, just finding those clinical trials. We, we try to keep a repository. Most of our repository is on targeted therapies, the basket trials, just like they're saying. But but I feel like patients are always asking and we're asking, why do we, this was one of the questions, why do we have to do it? Like, isn't there a better way than in a rare disease community, all of us can keep informed about what's out there. And to, to date, I guess the answer is no, because each institution is doing its own kind of thing, except people like you will come and share. So you can run, but you can't hide, Dr. Foote. Um, you no, I'm here. <laughs> no, you're great. Um, and you mentioned CAR T therapy. We did get a question. So, so is that now something being used to treat appendiceal cancer or not yet? Great question. So the tricky part about CAR T that we just have to be aware of is that, like I said, they're insanely expensive. They're like a million to a million and a half dollars a person. So, um, but the thing that we can keep in mind is they are targeted. So the, the sphere that we give them in the lab is against a specific type of antigen, right? Protein on the cell right. surface. So if your appendix tumor has one of these antigens, that's very enticing, then you could be a candidate for it. The truth is there aren't that many CAR T trials open, yeah. especially in lower GI cancers. There are, there's the one I mentioned in stomach cancer. I think that people are very interested. They're, they're trying to do this for pancreatic cancer, which as we know, is a very tough disease. Um, I really want to get a CAR T study done in, in colorectal cancer. I actually approached some people at the cellular therapy service uh, a couple of weeks ago about that. Um, but there are people thinking about it. None that I know of yet. If, if you, if any, if anybody finds one, they'll shoot me an email, let me know. Um, but it's a good idea. I think it's a cool technology. The tricky part is you have these super soldiers charging into battle and then they hit this immunosuppressive cold environment with like sleeping dust around the tumor, and then they just go to sleep. So that's the tough part about CAR T cells is it's, it, you know, they can be really excited, but the tumors are smart and they make the sleeping dust around them. I'm sort of being silly, but you know what I'm no, saying? Yeah. And they can and turn does. them off. Yeah. And that's the tricky part with pancreas cancer. It's the tricky part with colon cancer. They're pretty good at getting away from the immune system. And the reason why is actually pretty straightforward. Remember, the colon and the appendix live in the GI system. What else lives in the GI system? Bacteria, right? Bacteria help us digest food. If the immune system is really, really hyper excited against weird looking stuff, it's gonna kill all the bacteria and then you wouldn't be able to digest food. So the, the colon, the appendix, they tolerate weirdness at higher levels than other organs do. So that's one of the reasons why immunotherapy is a little bit more tricky in, in people. That Deborah, do you mind? There's a really good question in the chat. I was yeah, I was going to gonna say, this. let's jump and divvy up. Yeah, please. I, I think we up. have we have so many great ones. And actually, if it's okay with you, I'm happy to stay a few minutes over. I don't know if that would be tough tough for the team, um, but I'm happy to stay a little bit longer. It's okay with okay. us as long as we don't zap out. 
Um, <laughs> Yeah, that sounds good. I, I yeah, yeah. Fine. yeah. I just want to because there's some really good questions yeah, in the chat. Please do. So, um, so one of the questions by autonomous attendee said, uh, "My question is about bispecific therapies. Aren't the mucus antigens present in other healthy cells? How do you target it to cancer cells?" That's a really good question. So, immunotherapies are marketed as being really well tolerated, right? Everybody wants immunotherapy compared to chemo. The truth is, they probably are better tolerated. When you give someone, let's say, a PD-1 antibody, the classic Keytruda that you see on the news, probably about 70% of patients will be fine and hardly will have any side effects at all. But one in four people will probably have a side effect. And these side effects are autoimmune side effects, meaning the immune system makes a mistake and accidentally damages healthy tissue. And that's what this, this person is getting at in their question. This can happen with any sort of immune boosting therapy. The immune system could get overexcited, come out swinging, and accidentally cause a serious problem with a side effect by damaging normal cells. The way that bispecific antibodies help to bypass this is by um, trying to find the right balance between having a marker that's present in a lot of cancer cells but not very present in the rest of the body. And that's tough, but there are a lot of, there's a lot of research about that. So most of the bispecific antibodies are against targets that are very specific to, col to, to the cancer, appendix cancer, colon cancer. Um, and then I might just answer, do you mind if I just run through a few more live ones? Please, uh, go, go through those, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm actually really, I'm really impressed by these. Um, and I apologize if I don't get to all of your questions. So Olga had mentioned, um, uh, these are mostly patients with, with um, metastatic. That's exactly right, Olga. Um, you know, if it's non-metastatic, we really try to remove the tumor if possible, if um, because those patients could be cured with a surgery. Um, now, I mentioned the rectal cancer was actually not metastatic. The amazing case I showed you, that was an early stage cancer, but that's a special type. That's the mismatch repair deficient. Now, if a patient has um, cancer only in the lymph nodes, but it's not surgically removable, which does happen sometimes. That's okay. You know, immune cells live in lymph nodes. That's their little houses. So sometimes immunotherapies can work well with the right treatment if it's in the lymph nodes. But I don't want to overpromise because the same things apply. If cancer's in the lymph nodes, it can also turn the immune system off. So you still have to have the right drugs. Um, I, good question about, so there, uh, Af, Af, Mr. Uh, Af uh, mentioned, do you know of any research looking at these new drugs in local peritoneum instead of chemo? Hypec, so I, 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 Hypec is a, a two hour lecture in itself. Um, I don't, I think specifically to this talk, uh, you know, people have looked at trying to do immune boosting regimens inside of the abdominal cavity, mostly in mice. We have some research on that too. Not a lot in people, but it's an interesting idea. I think the tricky part about doing intraperitoneal chemo, immunotherapy, is that it doesn't tend to last very long. Your body constantly bathes the inside of itself with fluid, and that washes away drugs, including HIPEC, including immunotherapy. So that's why it only lasts maybe 30, 60 minutes, and then it's gone. And it not, might not be enough time for it to kill the cancer cells. So that's a challenge that we have to overcome. We probably can, but a lot of smart people are thinking about that. Um, I'm going to skip just to a couple, and then I, we can do... Um, yeah, uh, Ricky, um, there is, there's really cool stuff with uh, uh, CAR-Ts. Most of the stuff is in mice. You know, I, I work with mice. It's pretty easy to cure cancer in a mouse. You know, it's the first step. It's important and it's exciting. I don't want to rain on anyone's parade. It's much harder in a human. So I think, and a lot of these studies are done with cell lines that are very hot. Remember I told you about hot versus cold. A lot of the cell lines that we use are hot. They have a lot of mutations. So we just have to make sure that it's actually the right model for us. But I'm, but I'm excited to hear that. Hopefully it works out well. Um, I might stay away from some of the questions that are a little bit more personal. Sorry, guys. But um, you know, feel free uh, to, to reach out again. Um, I think I'm just going to look at a couple more. And then if Deborah has a few more, we can stay five or 10 minutes after. Um, Mike, Mr. Wright has a good question. This webinar highlights the importance of genomic testing. How prevalent is genomic testing across the U.S. for appendix seal cancer? So we really think that genomic testing should be done in uh, in everybody that has stage four disease, um, specifically looking for the mutations. Um, you know, we're finding that it gives us information about how well the cancers do. Um, insurance should pay for it, and uh, a lot of the clinical trials that are coming out include 
genomic information to get you on the study. So I think it's a very good question. I would encourage you to ask your oncologist about genetic testing for uh, for the tumor, if you have, especially if you have stage four disease. If you have early stage disease, it's not as relevant because we're going to try and do surgery and take it out. Um, uh, good questions. Um, does mismatch repair deficient appendix cell cancer do well with KTU? A very good question. So, mismatch repair deficient appendix cell cancer is vanishingly rare. In fact, if I see a mismatch repair deficient tumor that says it's an appendix cancer, I actually wonder if it's been misdiagnosed because it's much more likely to have actually been a colon tumor from the cecum, which is right outside the appendix, than it is to be an appendix cancer. These tumors are not common uh, with mismatch repair deficiency. That being said, it's theoretically possible for any cancer to be a mismatch repair deficient tumor. I could talk about that for two hours. So if it is truly a mismatch repair deficient tumor, if it came from the appendix or the cecum, I don't care. Give it immunotherapy. So it almost doesn't matter. It's an academic question. If there is an appendix cancer with mismatch repair deficient, give it immunotherapy. If it's been misdiagnosed, doesn't matter. Give it immunotherapy. Great question. Um, Hopefully this is helpful, guys. I'm going to do a couple more. Um, yeah, people are oh, sort of asking. This is super some... helpful. Keep going. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. Uh, there's some personal questions coming through, and I apologize, guys. Yeah. I'm just going to I'm gonna try and um, I, I apologize. It's not the right setting for those. Um, actually, Deborah, uh, if, you, if you have a few more, I think now we're kind of at the point where we're getting a little bit more personal or, or maybe tangential questions. Sure. Well, um, a couple of general questions. One is, how do you see immunotherapy fit with lamin, if at all, with lamin specifically? Yeah. Such a good question. So lamins are the coldest of the coldest of the cold. <laughs> yeah. They don't have very many mutations. They might only have one. Many of them have basically zero. Um, they tend to be very slow growing, right? As, as you guys know, and uh, they don't like to spread to other organs other than the peritoneal cavity. They don't like spreading to the liver and the lungs but they can be very tough because if they can't be removed surgically, there's not a lot that chemo can do for them either. So I think it's a really neat idea. You know, one of the ideas I have is to try and study ways to boost the immune system against lamins. It's not impossible because they are abnormal, right? Remember we just said the immune system's job is to find abnormal stuff and lamins are not normal. So it's theoretically possible, but they don't do very well with immunotherapy. And then another kind of general question, any limitations about age and immunotherapy, regardless of what's being treated, but are there considerations there? Yeah. Good question. No, I think, I think immunotherapy can apply to all. It's pretty exciting. I have um, 80 and 90 year olds who are pretty sick, but they have a mismatch repair deficient tumor and we give them immunotherapy and disappears. Wow. It's pretty amazing. I know that that's is. where we want to get to with this disease too, with appendix yes. cancer. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. And then another question, we, we have a lot, you know, we get a lot of patient inquiries, patients with signet ring, um, appendix cell tumors. And we got a question about what are some of the second, third, fourth line options now for patients, either standard of care or that are in research, assuming that let's leave aside immunotherapy, but other other options that you can think of, second, third, fourth line. Yeah, you know, there's there's and there's some questions in the chat about this too. So, you know, for patients with traditional run-of-the-mill appendix cancer where it's spread outside of where it started, so stage four, chemotherapy is still our backbone. And you know, most people we borrow from colon cancer, which works pretty well. Um, so there's a couple different chemos. There's full Fox, there's full theory. Some of us use Avastin. Um, uh, you know, there are some protein inhibitors that might be applicable if your tumor has a very rare protein in it. Um, in the third and fourth line, there are drugs out there that are mostly chemo pills. Um, these pills can be pretty well tolerated. A new one is called Fruquintinib that was just approved for colorectal cancer. The tricky part is they don't shrink the cancer very much. They kind of keep it around the same size. And if you're, you know, if you're not having a lot of symptoms from the cancer, that's great. You know, if we freeze it in time and it stays that size forever, that's awesome. But a lot of people, when they get to the, you know, the third, fourth line are, are feeling pretty sick from their cancer. Um, 
I think the therapies I just mentioned are the most exciting ones. The only other one that's like a, a new category that isn't technically an immunotherapy, but is coming is something called ADCs or antibody drug conjugates. This is basically a homing missile where you have an antibody with a, with a target tip, like a homing beacon. And on the back of it, you have like a bomb. It's like a homing missile and it's targeted against the tumor and it comes in, then it delivers the bomb and the bomb is a toxin. It's a, it's a very strong chemotherapy that you wouldn't be able to give a patient, but with the homing missile, it makes it more specific to the cancer. And so people are looking at ADCs. You know, I, I, I'm sure there are people looking at this for appendix cancer. I don't specifically do that in my research, but um, that is a new therapy that hopefully will come soon. Wow. That's tremendous. And then I have just two more questions. Sure. One I'm very curious about. I don't know the reference to the data in the question. You might. This is one of the pre submits. What is, and I'm interested just because you said GNAS is one of the more common mutations. But the question is what is the utility of distinguishing GNAS mutation predominant versus other molecular subtypes given the data we have now? Do you understand? That's yeah, good. I do. I do. Yeah, that came from actually from my paper that that I I wrote. Okay. So, um, so what we did again, very briefly, because uh, never ask a scientist about his work because they'll just talk you off. Uh, <laughs> is uh, <laughs> we looked for some important proteins that the cancer cell might use to grow and to avoid our therapy. So, GNAS is one of the proteins that appendix cancer has more than any other cancer. So yeah. it was it drew our attention, and there are other people interested in this. Too. Pardon me and have written about this. Um, and GNAS is, in our, in our opinion, it's associated with mucinous tumors. The tumors tend to have more mucin. There tends to be a higher burden of disease inside of the abdomen. The tumors tend to grow a little bit more slowly than the ones I showed you with the TP53, but they also coat themselves in this mucin, and I think it helps them avoid chemo. It helps them ignore it, so the chemo just pelts off it. So I think uh, to the to the very good question that this person raised, right now we don't have any randomized controlled trials for GNAS, so I don't know if it would actually change your your treatment too much, but it might make your uh, doctors think that maybe if we're choosing between chemo and surgery, that we might want to think about surgery because the tumors might be a little bit slower growing and also a little bit more resistant to chemo, so it might not be the best option. That being said, we're learning about this in the lab. We have a lot of research projects on this, and um, I'm hoping that soon we'll have drugs against this protein. Um, yeah. So there's a lot going on with that. That's great. And final question, we get this a lot, CTDNA, Signaterra, other companies that are doing it. Do you um, have any thoughts on that? It, I guess this would be more, I think, from this question, which is a pre-submit. It looks like a uh, use of that for surveillance, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, CTDNA. So CTDNA is a huge area of, of research. And uh, you know, we have a we have a program at MSK2, and, and I've been fortunate to be a part of some of it. Um, the tricky part is that appendix cancers don't tend to secrete that much CTDNA. There's some interesting new studies coming out now that I've been looking at um that that are interesting, but they don't secrete as much as some of the other types of cancer do. So you have to have a very, very sensitive assay and there are new sensitive assays that are coming across. The tricky part about CTDNA, if you're the patient or the doctor, is that sometimes we don't know what to do with it. We get the result in the computer and let's say it's positive and the patient turns to us and they might be very anxious. They might say, well, how, what do I do about this? And we say, uh, let's just watch you because there's no research data to show us that acting on CTDNA alone, if there's nothing on the scan, makes a difference. And we don't like to put people on chemo indefinitely if we don't see any tumors on the scan. It's, it's, it's a lot, there's side effects. And you know, so there are trials going on right now in colorectal cancer looking at this, which I think are really helping us learn about whether treating someone just because of CTDNA is a good idea or not. As a scientist, I actually was uh, part of the lab that it like basically invented this. I was I was very young, I, you know. I won't take any credit for that, but my mentor's mentor is Bert Vogelstein at Hopkins, who like basically figured out how to measure this stuff. Um, I think it's really important. I think it's powerful. I think it will be the future. 
I just don't know if in 2024 in March, if we know a lot of what to do with it. Um, I think often it causes a lot more anxiety and stress than it's worth. Um, I think if the best place for it right now is if you have an early stage appendix tumor and your doctor takes it out and they say, well, we're kind of on the fence about giving you chemotherapy or not. There's some features of the tumor that concern us, but then again, there's other features that make us feel more relieved. Some doctors will send a ctDNA blood test. And if it's positive, they do the chemo. And if it's negative, they don't. And that's a that's a very reasonable approach because then you're actually using the test to make a decision. If you're just ordering the test to order it, bad idea, because it's not going to actually change your mind and it's just going to create anxiety. Yeah. Great. Well, we are over time. Uh, we tried to get to as many questions as we could. Dr. Foote, uh, thank you so, so much on behalf of the ACP and E and our whole community. You are just always so terrific, so lovely, so crystal clear. Oh, I know thanks. I tell you that all the time, but you really are. And we're lucky to have you on the team. So thank you. Thank and you thanks much. everybody for your time and attention and good thoughtful questions. And we'll be doing this again soon. Okay. Looking thank forward you. To it. Thanks everybody. Good night. Well.